We have uh, Mike Hallworth, and he's actually for a few more days with the Migratory Bird Center at Smithsonian. But then I'm lucky enough to have him join our lab at um, the University of Massachusetts in the Northeast Climate Data Teaching Science. Um, Mike's going to be talking about the cost of reproduction in a green world. <laughs> thanks everyone, and thanks for coming in. Um, so, this has been great so far, talking about range, ranges, different community species. I'm going to take a deep dive into how climate is influencing individuals uh, in New Hampshire. <coughs> so, um, a third of bird species in all of North America require urgent conservation action, so just let that sink in for a second one of every three birds in all of North America. Um, and the ocean species here are, have the, the largest peril. Um, and if we go down to the boreal birds, which this area in this study by the <coughs> of the birds, um, most of the birds here that are having issues are these long distance beautiful migrants that spend the winter in the tropics and breed up here um, in the northern forest. So that, leads us to wonder how might these birds, as they're preparing to leave the tropics, um, be influenced by things that are happening up here in response to climate change. And one of those things is, is potential phenology mismatches. And this is data from Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest, which I'll talk a little bit about today. And this is the full leaf expansion date of sugar maple has been increasing <coughs> in the order of five days per decade. Um, and so if you're thinking about if you're a bird in the tropics and you're cued in on into day length changes when you migrate, there might be some mismatches uh, when you arrive, might be the migration timing, spring arrival, or the timing of breeding. And a lot of research has gone into this early spring phenological mismatches. We know from Hubbard Brook that the black throated blue warbler, which I'm going to talk about today, times their breeding with that date of full leaf expansion. They eat caterpillars, and if they lay their clutch um, on the day of full leaf expansion, they produce more young than if they do early or late after that date. In addition to the earlier springs, we're having later falls at Hubbard Brook. Uh, as a consequence, we're having a longer breeding season. And so how might that influence the birds that we're seeing here, or the breed in this region? Will they prolong their breeding? Um, and if they do, is there this cost of reproductive effort? Is this costly <coughs> to breed? And so, yeah, sorry, will this longer green season influence the cost of reproduction? So you may ask, what the heck is the cost of reproduction? Um, and that's the trade-off between current reproductive effort and future reproductive gains. And this is really evident in long-lived seabirds, where they're capable of breeding every year, but if they breed in one year, they often skip the next year because it was so costly to breed the previous. <laughs> we don't generally see that in migratory songbirds. And there's been a lot of studies, and only a few have supported this. There's uh, like tree swallow in Maine, and a uh, flycatcher in Europe, and also some swallows in Europe that have seen a reduced effort <clears throat> from one year to the next. So then that leads to the question, where are the costs of reproduction, assuming it's costly, where are those manifested in migratory songbirds? So, um, I'm, I took advantage of this epic data set at Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest. It's 21 years of data on the black throated blue warbler, which breeds in um, northern forests northern forest, and winters in the Caribbean basin. This population winters in the Dominican Republic and in uh, Jamaica from tracking studies, and it's doing surprisingly well. Um, their population is not changing at all. And in this data set, there's about 1,200 females. They're individually marked 1,300 males, uh, and <coughs> about 1,300 individual nests, and about 4,000 fledglings that were tracked over the, this time. And we're not seeing any decrease in reproductive effort from one year to the next. So what this means is um, your reproductive effort in year T doesn't influence your reproductive effort in year T plus one. And if we did see this reproductive, a cost of reproductive effort, every one of these bars should be below zero. I mean, you're decreasing your fledglings at, through time. But that's not the case. 
So here it leads me to these questions. Where is the cost of reproduction manifested? It's likely manifested on survival. And if it is, how does the environment mediate those costs of reproduction? In the species, we know that the reproductive effort is different between age classes and, species and sex. Uh, for example, the number of eggs laid, the more eggs that you lay, it means that they're, um, she's laying more eggs, they typically lay a four egg clutch. And so if they lay more than four eggs, that means their first egg, their first nest was depredated and they're continuing to breed. Um, so we thought that would be costly. The number of days that she spent incubating, which means she's on the nest incubating eggs and can't feed herself uh, as readily as she would. The number of days spent actually feeding nestlings because they do double brood. Um, so there could be lots of uh, days spent feeding nestlings. Uh, and the social young raised for females. And for males, um, we looked at the days feeding nestlings. Also, social young raised, those are the, the young in his nest that he's feeding, but they also have extra pair uh, copulations where they seek out other females and, and sire young in other nests. Uh, and so we looked at within pair young sired and extra pair young for males, and then the total offspring that he sired within that season as our metrics of reproductive effort. And so if you've ever done any survival analysis, you know that it's a pretty tricky business because you don't detect individuals perfectly every time. And over the course of our study, our study site changed uh, 21 years. So I use the space of the explicit capture recapture model to get at survival um, that models movement and as well as survival and um, detection probability. And so these changing globs here are the different plot sizes, and each point is an individual's location through time. And we know each individual because they're individual with color model. And I use this. Uh, Bayesian variable selection to see which of the um, variables we're interested in in reproductive effort where it's most costly. And so you're going to see this in the next couple of slides. This x-axis here is the variable importance. So if it's next to zero, it was virtually unimportant, never in that model. And if it was close to one, then that variable was really important. And so what we found for females is that the total amount of eggs laid was really important for female survival, particularly for older experienced females. And for males, we found that the within pair young sired was, it was moderately important for their survival and total genetic offspring for older males. So what we found here, this is the total number of eggs laid. This is standardized. So on this end, there's lots of eggs laid within a season. On the left side there, that's fewer eggs laid within a season, so a single clutch. And we found that survival increased with the number of eggs laid totally counter to what we uh, <laughs> And for males, what we found is higher survival when there's fewer uh, within young uh, sire. So on this end, there's many young sire. Many of his eggs uh, that he was tending were his actual chicks. Um, and you have higher survival if uh, you have fewer of those within perigone. So, um, if a male spent a lot of time <coughs> mate guarding, he would have a lot of his within pair young. Um, so this it might be costly to mate guard to prevent extra pair young within your nest. Okay, so we do find some sort of cost of reproduction in a way. Um, so how does the environment that they're experiencing mediate that cost? And so just to reorient you here, this is Hubbard Brook data again. We know that the green season is getting longer. Uh, this is where our study plot is, and over that study plot, our green cure rate varies about 20 days. Um, so when the leaves come on, so leaf senescence. So we added these two variables, the date of leaf expansion, which we know is really important for black litter blue uh, females when they start laying their eggs. And then the potential length of the green season, they may prolong their breeding. So how might that mediate the cost of reproduction in the species? And so here's variable importance again. Um, anything on the right-hand side is really important. Anything on the left-hand side is not important. And we found the length of the green period was really important for female survival, as well as the leaf expansion date. Uh, and then, again, the total eggs laid. So this is what this looks like. Um, I guess I could use this. Uh, on this end of the x-axis is a really late year in terms of leaf expansion. On this end of the axis is a really early year. Uh, and this is 
female survival here. And these are two different age classes, so first year breeders and um, <coughs> experienced females. And what we found is that probability of survival decreases sharply with, with leaf expansion dates. So lowest survival in late years, or in years following late years. And for the, the length of the green period, at this end of the axis here is a really long green period, and at this end of the axis is a short green period, and we find that female survival is really high in short years and really low following long years for both age classes. So if we switch now to males, um, we look at the interaction here between the social young rays and the length of the green period it tends to be important the length of the green period, and also leaf expansion date, as well as those other ones within periodontal and total genetic offspring sire, which I talked about a little bit earlier. So for young males, so their first year breeding, what we're finding is that um, if leaf expansion date is late, they have higher survival. And, if, and for older males, the length of the green period in long years, they have low survival. Uh, so there seems to be some interaction between survival and the environment they experience. So for males, we see um, this, sorry about this complicated graph here. Um, on this axis here, we have a short green season and a long green season. <coughs> this axis is survival. And here, this is total number of genetic offspring, because this was an interactive plot. Um, we have few genetic offspring here and many here. We find is the highest survival is found in years where they have lots of offspring in short years. And the counter to that is, in long years with low survival, um, they have few young. So for me, this suggests to me that while well, there might be some cost of um, reproductive reproduction on survival, that's compounded a little bit about by uh, individual quality for females and potentially permanent integration for both sexes. Because it doesn't really make sense that if you have no young in long years, that you have the lowest survival. Um, so there, that suggests to us that we just never see them again, and they're gone. Um, and our model, even though it accounts for movement and a little bit of dispersal, we can't get for really regional scale dispersal. So in the context of the environment, we know that there is a cost, potential cost of reproduction. Um, and it, does play a role, but the mechanisms here are unexplored at this point. So are they phenological mismatches? We're not sure. How does the food availability change in short green years versus long green years? Does food continue on um, past when we're actually surveying them? And does their parental care, the duration of that, does that continue later in green seasons? We don't know. After birds kind of fledge their nest and the adults follow them through the forest, we lose track of them and we don't know what's happening during that time frame. So we need to really kind of get a handle on that. So what's next? Um, we are currently tracking these birds with these things called light level geolocators um, and we, this is the schedule based on those tags and so we know that they arrive in May and we know that they leave in September. Um, but they stop breeding here. Um, so what the heck is happening during this period? We have no clue. So these are some of the next things that we're going to do. We know this is super costly to birds because this is when they're molting new feathers. Um, and so this is really metabolically important for, for those species um, that change over their feathers. We don't know anything about food or how the length of the green season might influence this. And so um, here's my kind of pitch to bring it back to conservation a little bit. Um, how do we maintain black-throated blue warblers going as the world is getting greener? And so we know that the longer green period is correlated with reduced adult survival. Um, so how to counter that? Uh, we can maintain habitats where they're reproductively successful, even if they live a short amount of time. Uh, so they can produce lots of offspring. And how to do that? Um, we can promote robust food webs because they are they eat lots of reps or caterpillars. And if they have a really robust, healthy native understory where these birds primarily get all their food to, to um, 
to feed their young. That's super important. And that actually, the amount of food actually trumps habitat quality. So Sarah Kaiser, uh, a colleague of mine, did really great work uh, where she experimentally fed birds. And birds that were experimentally fed at far and above higher reproductive success, um, more so than the, diff the difference between high and low quality habitat. So if we can conserve areas that have robust food webs uh, with native other story species, it would be really great for the species. And um, I'd be remiss if I didn't kind of acknowledge some of my co-authors, Dick Holmes here, who started this, this study a long, long time ago, um, had the foresight to actually do that. It's fantastic. Um, Scott Sillett, Mike Webster, Nick Rodenhouse, and Sarah Kaiser. Um, and if I have any time, I'd be happy to take questions. <coughs> So that's an interesting concept to think about uh, food quality and abundance as uh, a, a metric to focus conservation on. I've never really heard of that before. I was curious if you came across that anywhere else. Like, do people actually think about understanding that before they make decisions about conservation? I'm I'll put you on the spot. Yeah, there. I'm not sure. <laughs> well, and, I should mention that I'm biased because my my significant other works really closely with food, and she is an ophthalmologist. Um, and so I think about that a lot. But in terms of conservation, I'm not sure. And I think it's hard because we don't know what actual s species are there in a lot of cases and, and how much of it is there because it's super hard. You think it's hard to count birds, try to count caterpillars. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not sure. But having yeah. native yeah. understory would likely yeah. promote that by default. What do you think about? Oh, yeah, can I pose a question? <laughs> um, what do you think about more eggs laid and higher survival from trade-offs? Well, I was going to ask about that. Actually, it is counterintuitive. Do you think it's a matter of intrinsic quality of the individuals? I think so. Yeah, and and that if you're successful, you come back to that spot, which looks like you have higher survival, and if you're not. We get out of dodge, and even though we account for movement, we can't account for permanent migration. <coughs> yeah. okay. Well, was that more eggs per season? In other words, if they're re-nesting a lot, or was that more per nest that you did? I missed that. No, one. sorry. Yeah, that's within season. So almost all <coughs> clutches are four egg clutches. Right. Uh, so that that means that they're re-nesting or or having more eggs that. So I was wondering if there was maybe, but I, when I saw that, I thought, well, maybe it had something to do with when the female has to feed young, it's actually harder to feed young and more stressful than it is to actually just keep laying more eggs. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not sure. Other questions? So if a female green nest, the male is doing more of a fledgling than if she just has one fledge. So I'm not sure if it's I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It's hard to get at some of these mechanisms because we don't know. It's hard to follow birds after they fledge young unless we're tracking rad. Um, a lot of times it's really just going to Maybe I missed it, but was there a graph that showed the probability that they would have a second clutch given the longer growing season? It seems like an obvious. Yeah, it's, it's, I didn't show that figure, but it's, it's in that model. Yeah. Um, and so it turns out that the committing thing isn't, doesn't change with the longer green season, which is interesting enough. And then the fall thing is really interesting too, to also keep ideas about that, right? Like how fall is affecting things. Yeah, I'm open to it. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks for sticking with us this whole time.